Okay, I've got about half an hour to kick this off. And uh, this, is, this is setting the scene. So apologies for those of you who are older than me and who will say, we know our history better than he does. But not everybody in the room is older than me. So we're going to have a little bit of history here. And we're basically trying to cover very quickly that jagged backwards. What we're going to try and look at here is 130 years of African agricultural history. And we're going to look at the fluctuating ideas that we've had about Africa, about optimism and pessimism. And then after that, we're going to have a quick look, a rather brief look, at the performance of African agriculture across the continent by major regions and by selected countries over the last 20 years. And this is just a sort of attempt to say where have we come from, what kinds of things have we seen uh, to set the scene for discussing what contemporary policy issues are. Now, if we look at history, you can summarize an awful lot of modern African history from the 1880s and the colonial invasions through to the 1960s as Africa being seen as a land of opportunity. Initially in the 1880s, in the last couple of decades of the 19th century, the realization of a vent for surplus, that Africa had capacity to produce more, didn't necessarily have the markets, the metropolitan markets of Europe were demanding imports of tropical produce. And here we have a couple of examples. This is groundnuts in the Bassin d'Arachide in Senegal. These, of course, uh, is cocoa here in Ghana. Later on in history, we come to the coffee explosions seen in uh, East Africa in particular. Africa is a land of opportunity. Now, I went to university in uh, 1969, which is a while back. And in 1969, I went as a geographer. And as geographers, we were allowed to specialize in three particular regions, Latin America, Africa, or Asia. Yeah? And it's interesting what the class thought about that. We all put our hands up for Latin America. You know why? It was 1969. It was revolution. It was Che Guevara. Latin America was terribly fashionable. Yes? Second on the list was Africa because Africa was the la still the land of opportunity. It was the place with the resources, newly independent, that was going to go ahead. Asia, nobody chose Asia. There were a hundred of us in our class. Nobody chose the Asian options. You know why? Because Asia was just misery. Famines, terrible poverty, far too many people, that was the thinking at the time, no possibilities for development. So nobody signed up to the Asian option. Absolutely astonishing. I'm delighted to, to say now we all made the wrong choice. <laughs> we all made the wrong choices for the wrong things. History makes fools of us all, <laughs> and particularly my class. So Africa as optimism, vent for surplus, uh, using unused factors of production for the famous export crops across the continent. A process that began in the 1880s, went on till the disaster of the early 1930s and the collapse of the commodity prices, but was revived during the Second World War and after the Second World War, particularly strongly in the country that I know best in Africa, Kenya, uh, where tea and coffee uh, was allowed to be grown by smallholders with tremendously good results um, after the Second World War. But then we come to the epoch which has far too much colored thinking about Africa. Uh, I've spent the last 15 years continually trying to push back against a tidal wave of literature which is about African failure. Now, where does this African failure narrative come from? It comes from the dreadful 1970s. So let's just remind ourselves what happened in this time. What we've got here is food production per capita 
index to the early 1960s, yeah? And we're going to look at an African index, a South American index, and Asia. How did that happen? It moved ahead with a, Maybe I was touching it. Okay, <laughs> so you know the story. You can see what happens. All the way through to 1970, there's not a big divergence. But from here, we get these dreadful 1970s. And this massive divergence between the red of Asia, which is screaming upwards thanks to the Green Revolution, which is also going up pretty quickly in South America through Green Revolution, but also use of land, but Africa per capita is going down and down and down. So that by the time we reach the early 1980s, Africa's food production per capita is less than 90% of what it was in the early 1960s. Now, this dreadful 1970s makes a mess of all kinds of statistics. Um, Later, I'm going to show you what this graph looks like if we rebase it to the early 1980s and have a look what's happened since then. And then we get a slightly different vision. But an awful lot of the narrative on Africa has been influenced by this... It's stepping on the cables. If I step on the cables, it clicks on. Yeah. Okay. Now, look. The dreadful 1970s, you know, adding to this awful historical image, some of you will remember this five-year drought in the Western Sahel, all the way from Senegal across to Chad for five long years from 68 to 73. We had these repeated droughts in the Sahel causing massive uh, loss of livestock, massive loss of harvest, destruction of livelihoods, distress migration, enormous um, aid into this area. This led, of course, to the environmental negatives, na narratives about Africa being a land in which environmental degradation was created by humans. And the great irony today, the great irony today is that when this was taking place, the blame was often put on poor people in the Sahel who were overcutting, overgrazing, overdoing this, overdoing this, that, and the other because they were too poor and they didn't know better. The reality was the people who wrote that up were the ones causing the damage because we know what was happening was that the rainfall was reduced thanks to changes in the ocean currents, almost certainly linked to early phases of global warming. One of history's great, it's not even that, it's when you stand close to it. So look, bad agricultural performance in the 1970s, environmental, the apparent environmental destruction of the Sahel, these enormous negative um, images of Africa led to an industry amongst academics in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, trying to explain what had gone wrong with what only 10, 20 years earlier had been the continent of opportunity. What had happened to all this opportunity? Well, one set of narratives said it's African exceptionalism. The problems of Africa are down to its geography or to its institutions. So you'll have seen accounts that say, Africa is unusual in having large areas of variable rainfalls, not particularly fertile soils, landlocking, arguments about tropical diseases, malaria, and there's even an argument about the very shape of Africa and what that does to its, its geographical possibilities. And then there are a set of arguments about institutions, the land tenure story, for example. The argument that there isn't investment on the land because it's down to collective tenure and so on. Very, very dubious arguments, but nevertheless, they were trotted out. So there's a whole school that said African exceptionalism. This, of course, is the gloomiest of gloomy accounts at the time because there's not a great deal you can do about geography. Then there were the radicals. 
interpretations of Africa's travails, which basically said Africa, although independent, is still horribly dominated by the metropolitan centers of the world. And the trade conditions, the conditions of aid, the conditions of loans, mounting debts, and the general operation of a world capitalist system will always be in a position that it will extract surplus from the periphery, Africa being on the periphery, and that we will lose our richness to the metropolitan centers under the kinds of processes that Marx and followers of Marx predicted. So that was also uh, quite a well-honed narrative at the time. It was Africa's insertion into the world capitalist system. A third set of explanations said, well, it's, it's just down to policy. Um, and here was the World Bank's take on it. Um, Negative protection, and we'll see what negative protection is at a moment, basically extracting surpluses from farmers. The general argument about a bias to urban development, uh, to the cities, a bias against agriculture, and a critique of many of the marketing boards, the parastatals, as having become inefficient, politicized, excessively interventionist, heavy cost, and in general, not doing the job that they did, and in fact, becoming a drawback on the system. Now, as we look at this kind of writing now, with the benefit of, what, 20 years of hindsight from the high watermark of writing in this, in this mode, there's little doubt that this exceptionalism has faded into the background, thank goodness. This idea here... Um, dependency theory was dead by the end of the 1980s. I used to teach it in Reading. And by the time we got to the end of the 1980s, I was trying to explain to students why dependency theory had been defeated intellectually. It didn't add up empirically. It was a magnificent theoretical framework for which there just was no empirical confirmation, or hardly any. The strange thing, of course, is that this has come roaring back in the last 10 years. It isn't called dependency theory, theory but the anti-globalization literature, which you must be familiar with, is a recasting of this. But these arguments here were enormously influential. And they were enormously influential because by the early 1980s in Africa, uh, we moved into the epoch of structural adjustment, macroeconomic dis disequilibria of a kind that meant the only way that Africa could continue was if they could reach an agreement with the IMF, the World Bank, and the major donors, and the conditionalities that were there. And if you were going to reach an agreement with the IMF, the World Bank, and so on, you more or less had to accept this particular narrative and the policy prescriptions that came with it. Now, of course, this is tremendously uh, debated as to whether this is the correct analysis. Though I have, that, though I have one of my colleagues, um, Osman Badian, who has an interesting take on this, who on uh, more than one occasion um, speaks and says, the reforms that took place in the 80s and 90s were extremely painful in Africa, but we shouldn't renege on those reforms because there have been benefits. Now, I'll take that uh, up later for those of you who are not convinced. Okay, look, this urban bias, this urban bias. Let me just show you the sorts of evidence that we're dealing with here. This chart is showing us, amazingly, it runs back to 1955, and runs through to 2005. This is a chart of the net rate of assistance to agriculture in Africa, divided by all agriculture. This is amazing. A ghost in image. I don't need to touch anything. I just need to speed up to catch up with the graph as it moves across. We've got exportables here, which are the big cash crops, and up there is all agriculture. 
what you need to note here is that zero percent is right up there, yeah? All of this is negative. So this yellow one, which by 1975 has reached minus 50%, that indicates a 50% tax on average of producers of export crops in Africa. Now what you can see here is as this magically goes along, for reasons that completely technically defeat me, what you can see is the incredible reduction, particularly for the export crops, in the protection in the rate of assistance to, to agriculture. It's a massive period of time. And you don't need to be an economist to say, if you're taxing farmers at 50%, don't be surprised if they don't invest, if they don't innovate, if nothing goes ahead, yeah? This is the simple argument about negative protection. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's busy moving on of its own. Let's just complete the chart while we go, bring it up to the present. And what you see is it's, it's improved very considerably through to the present. But this dreadful 1970s, if I have to say, you know, what is a prime reason for the dreadful 1970s of Africa, I only have to plot this particular chart and I say, well, I've explained at least half the problems here, yeah? Uh, I don't expect farmers to react when they're being taxed to an extraordinary degree. By the way, if you, take, if you take particular crops in here, if you ever do this for a specific crop, I remember doing this for some Sierra Leonean crops in the 1970s, you end up with taxation rates in particular cases of 80%. Unbelievable rates of taxation. Most of that, of course, was not explicit taxation. It was marketing board margins, exchange rate overvaluation, which crippled farmers as producers of tradables. Now look, I want to show you now a quote here, and I'm not going to tell you who made this quote. I've removed the name of the author because they're far too good an author to have made a quote like this, but it's there in black and white. This is the pessimism. This is written in 1990. And it says here about Africa, only to feed her growing population at the present level of per capita food consumption, Africa would thus need to increase her food production at a rate of, say, 3.2% per year for several decades in succession. I want you to remember that number, 3.2%. If you can remember it for five minutes, it'll be useful. This is, of course, an impossible challenge for her to meet. This was said by a really serious academic in 1990. 3.2% per annum per capita growth of food. Impossible. And the guy could write that in 1990 and nobody said, you're an idiot. The guy isn't an idiot. The person who wrote this is a very clever guy. But this is the, this is the spirit of the time of 1990. I mean... There are plenty of the room who can remember just how pessimistic thinking about Africa had become at some points in the 1990s. So look, just to complete our story, right, yeah, 1990s is the time in which agriculture becomes lost to sight. And it becomes lost to sight for two reasons. One is that, ideologically, agriculture doesn't exist in the 1990s. Let me explain that to you. If you followed the Washington Consensus, the Washington Consensus says macroeconomic stability and growth processes are universal throughout the economy. No sector is special. We don't pick winners, yeah? We just get the macro framework correct. That's all we need to do. And so if you're not picking winners, why focus on agriculture? No sector is, is special. So agriculture faded into the background. And given that in the early 1990s, a whole series of aid donors evaluated their agricultural projects of the 1970s and 1980s, how many of you in this room, by the way, ever worked on an integrated rural development program in the 1970s? There's got to be some of the guilty people in the room here. 
And of course, the integrated rural development programs by the mid 1990s, you didn't have to discuss these. Everybody knew total failure. Now that's a massive exaggeration, but that's what the that's what the evaluations were saying. And comparative evaluations across the world at the time said really problematical is Africa, really problematical within Africa is African agriculture, and really, really problematical in African agriculture is livestock. So Desiree is clearly one of the guilty ones. Worked in, on, on livestock in, in Zambia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, no. Some of, some of my best friends are vets, or were. <laughs> um, so, because of these various ideas, agriculture was lost to sight in the 1990s. Certainly, the aid donors moved their money out of agriculture into education, into health, into environment, into gender equality, all kinds of other things than agriculture. And uh, the main thing that we spent our time in the 1990s arguing over was the extent of factor market failings. Now, I'll go into this in more detail later, um, later today. Factor market failings, why is it that African farmers couldn't get the right kinds of seed, fertilizer, short-term credit, financial services, and so on? Uh, did this amount to poverty traps, as Jeffrey Sachs famously argued, and uh, what was going wrong on the factor markets? Was it a matter of government failure, continued policy shortcomings? Was it that the real costs of